Tonight, Rush Hour Wrestling Match. The dramatic video of a fist fight between two drivers on Canada's busiest highway. The brazen brawl in bumper to bumper traffic. This can turn violent, it could turn deadly. The growing dangers and the driving forces behind road rage. That goes hand in hand with low frustration tolerance. Providing an abandoned pledge to cut the GST on new rental construction. It's going to grow supply immensely across this country. New expectations for an old promise as Liberal support slumps in a deepening housing crisis. What this is is a photo op fund. Plus, tracking Lee. There will be some big rollers coming through this harbor. The potential for severe weather as the storm pushes towards Atlantic Canada. When it will hit and where. CTV National News with Omar Sachadina. Good evening, everyone. Anyone who gets behind the wheel knows that any drive can involve ducking and dodging dangerous obstacles along the way. This, however, is far less common. Video released today shows a dramatic and dangerous fist fight on the 401. Two men stopping their vehicles in live lanes of traffic in what police are calling an unacceptable example of road rage. Call the police! Call the police! It's the latest example of tempers flaring between drivers. Oh! Oh my God! And what happens when anger turns into a weapon on the road? CTV's Heather Wright on the new highway escalation and the warnings tonight. Road rage at a whole new level. Two men fighting on the highway in the middle of rush hour traffic. Kind of speechless when I see that kind of behavior on the road. Sergeant Kerry Schmidt says road rage may be relatively common, but it rarely escalates to a full blown brawl on Canada's busiest highway. The incident happened when traffic was moving slowly, but Schmidt says it's still not clear what precipitated the fight as there was no crash beforehand. Several drivers called 911 to report it. We did have a license plate and we did follow up with uh, at least one of the drivers. Uh, there was a discussion, a, a warning, uh, no charges were laid. In Brampton, Ontario this morning, a similar fight with two men wrestling on the road, forcing cars to drive around them. Most police services don't track road rage incidents, so it's not clear whether more are happening or if they're just being caught on camera. In Toronto back in August, this motorcyclist appears to shout obscenities at a cyclist before entering the bike lane, hitting the person on the bike and driving off. What are you saying, fam? While this driver nearly hit pedestrians, fleeing an alleged road rage incident. When people behave like this, a lot of times it goes hand in hand with low frustration tolerance. There's also a level of anonymity some feel when behind the wheel. You don't have eye contact with them as one example. So all of these things get you a little bit more hot under the collar than you would if you had a face-to-face -face interaction. You'd be better at self-regulating. And rage can creep up more easily on the road. The problems that we're facing when we're stuck in gridlock are not problems that we can solve. And perhaps it's that feeling of lack of control that contributes to the anger that started the fight. No one was seriously injured in this most recent incident and charges won't be laid, but police remind drivers it is illegal to walk on major highways like the 401 and obviously can be extremely dangerous. Omar. All right, Heather, thank you. And we are learning tonight of unheeded warnings about the Vancouver triple stabbing suspect months before his rampage in Chinatown. The B.C. Review Board had raised concerns that the 64-year-old was a significant threat to public safety back in April. The man who killed his daughter was on a day pass from a psychiatric facility when he allegedly attacked three strangers last Sunday. How a violent, psychotic individual was released into community to attack innocent people is the question. To examine that decision, B.C.'s Premier today appointed former Abbotsford Police Chief Bob Rich. Jurors in a southwestern Ontario courtroom were shown dramatic and heartbreaking video today of the final few moments before a Muslim family was struck and killed by a pickup truck two years ago. The footage was submitted by the prosecution at the murder trial of Nathaniel Veltman. CTV's Nick Paparello was there. 
It is chilling video which shows the scene at the intersection of Hyde Park Road and South Carriage Road in London on June 6, 2021. Taken from a surveillance camera from a nearby business, the timestamp on the video is off by about 14 minutes. In the upper right corner, you can see five members of the Opsal family walking towards the intersection. Mother Medea, Father Salman, daughter Yumna, grandmother Talat, and a nine-year-old son are all there. Then you can observe a black Ram pickup truck with its lights on come across the screen heading northbound. The court is heard. The vehicle makes a U-turn. Then, seconds later, you can see the pickup truck speeding south in the direction of the family. The court exhibit has been edited to stop before the moment of impact. Four members of the Offsall family died after being run over. The lone survivor was the young boy who is now with relatives. Minutes later, police would arrest Nathaniel Veltman about four kilometers away in a shopping mall parking lot. They also seized a black Ram pickup truck. The 22-year-old Veltman has pled not guilty to four counts of first-degree murder and one count of attempted murder. Throughout the day, the jury continued to watch extended video of Veltman following his arrest in a holding cell at London Police Headquarters. Wearing a white T-shirt with a black cross on the front and back, Veltman is constantly pacing. At one point, he is on the phone, and from time to time, he either sits or lays down on a concrete slab in the cell. Later, the jury sees that he is being fingerprinted. As he sits in the courtroom with the video playing, Veltman looks at the screen, or every once in a while, he stares at the ceiling. Nick Paparella, CTV News, Windsor. A pledge the Liberals first made when they were trying to get into power eight years ago is back on the table tonight over one of the biggest issues facing Canadians. The government says it will make it cheaper to build rental homes. CTV's Judy Trin reports. An orchestrated show of support for a policy the Liberals campaigned on in 2015, but didn't put into action until now. Removing the GST from the construction of rental units. This plan is going to get more apartments built in big cities, in small towns, especially along transit lines, and they'll make sure that there are units with two or three or even more bedrooms. Rents are high because there are few vacancies. While high interest rates have spooked developers from building, this will entice some to get shovels into the ground. Anywhere we can reduce the costs towards housing right now is going to help develop uh, new households. Analysts say removing the GST will increase rental housing stock but it won't solve the crisis. I would say somewhere between 200,000 to 300,000 over the next uh, five to six years. So it's not the 3.5 million that the CMHC says we need, but it's a, it's a big st uh, step in the, in the right direction. The Liberals are also hoping it will stop the political bleeding. Multiple polls show Conservatives surging with double-digit leads, and Pierre Polyev's message is connecting. After eight years of Justin Trudeau and the NDP, housing costs have doubled. Rent has doubled. The Tories have even turned a rookie Liberals housing experience into an attack ad. I'm 32 years old. I'm a member of Parliament. I haven't been able to purchase a home. Despite calls from some caucus members to counter, Trudeau is taking the high road for now. Canadians don't want to see politicians arguing back and forth. Political sparring has pushed housing shortages to the top of the agenda across all levels of government. B.C., Ontario and Newfoundland are now considering dropping their provincial sales tax when it comes to new rental units. Omar. All right, Judy, thanks. Six months after the heads of Canada's biggest grocers testified before a parliamentary committee investigating food inflation, the Prime Minister has summoned them back to Ottawa to explain how they plan to stabilize prices. Five companies that make up 80% of the country's grocery market will be given until Thanksgiving to come up with an acceptable proposal. The Prime Minister has been very clear, and I talked to the, to the Minister of Finance, uh, you know, if they fail to act, there will be consequences. The government says those consequences could include tax measures. New indications tonight of the impact of inflation and high interest rates on Canadians. Credit card balances in this country have hit an all-time high. Equifax Canada says Canadian credit card debt soared to $107.4 billion in the second quarter. Payments are down as well, so those balances are increasing because consumers are just paying 
less than they were able to 12 months ago. The average non-mortgage debt per consumer is now more than $21,000. Most provinces in Atlantic Canada tonight are under severe weather watches as Hurricane Lee barrels towards Canadian waters. CTV's Heather Butts is on storm watch in St. John tonight. There's little time left to prepare for Hurricane Lee as its track becomes clearer by the hour. Confidence has grown in the storm's direction, heading right for southern New Brunswick and southwestern Nova Scotia. Work to secure the boats at this wharf in Digby underway. It's going to be really bad in here. It's going to be romping and ropes are going to be parting and... It's going to be a heck of a time, I do believe. The storm is massive. By the time it reaches the maritime, strong winds and heavy rain will be felt up to 300 kilometers from its center. Many communities along the Bay of Fundy are under a hurricane watch, expecting winds up to 120 kilometers per hour, and with that, the risk of storm surge and coastal erosion. Four to six meter waves are also possible along the coast. There's really not much more um, from a... a prevention perspective that we can do other than just staying away from those dangerous areas. Conditions Maritimers are familiar with, but every storm hits different. You live right on yes. the coast though, what's yeah. it like for you? It is, it, it, the wind comes hard, but most of the time it's actually where the wind is coming from, it's not where how hard it is. The Paulins live along the St. John waterfront and will be paying close attention to the wind direction. Here the building should be doing pretty well because of the uh, the way it's supposed to come in. While others are preparing to take a direct hit. The wind direction that they're calling for out of the south is straight up into the harbour, so there will be some big rollers coming through this harbour. It's not just the wind direction people are watching, but the tide. Here along the Bay of Fundy, with the highest tides in the world, the water level when the storm arrives will play a major role in how this story unfolds. Omar. All right, please stay safe. Heather Butts in St. John tonight. Let's bring in CTV meteorologist Kelsey McEwen. And today, Kelsey, we're getting a far better idea of when this storm will make landfall and exactly where it will hit. What can you tell us? Grand Manan, New Brunswick to Shelburne County, Nova Scotia. Omar, that's what we're watching very closely as this storm moves its way northward. And it actually could make landfall twice. First, along the southern coast of Nova Scotia, sometime around the supper hour on Saturday, cross the Bay of Fundy, make landfall for a second time in New Brunswick, sometime late Saturday night heading into Sunday morning. Both of these times could coincide with high tide in the region as well, which provides its own challenges for flooding. Then the storm will move its way to the northeast and out of the region by end of weekend. Now, two things add to the risk of flooding here. One is the storm, but the second is this stalled front that's been hovering over Atlantic Canada, bringing slow-moving thunderstorms, prompting 25 millimeters of rain per hour. So the ground is saturated. That was for Thursday. This is for Friday as well. It really can't hold much more moisture, but more is on the way. By Friday night, the outer bands of the, her the storm will move their way on shore. This is a full 24 hours ahead of the expected landfall on Saturday evening. The winds elevate. The strongest rainfall will be on the west and north of the track, the highest storm surge on the east, and the wind will be elevated. Wind gusts near 120 kilometers an hour, as well as those wave heights approaching four to six meters along the Atlantic coast of Nova Scotia. Omar? All right, Kelsey, thank you. Residents in St. John, New Brunswick, were also dealing with a stay indoors advisory today because of a massive fire. Plumes of hazardous smoke billowed from a raging fire at the American Iron and Metal Recycling Plant. No reports of any injuries. The United Nations revealed today most of the deaths from Libya's devastating flooding could have been avoided if a functioning weather service had issued warnings. The toll has now soared past 11,000 and is expected to go even higher. Behind that staggering number, countless families traumatized by unimaginable loss. CTV's Kevin Gallagher with one Ottawa family's heartbreaking appeal. As the desperate search for flood survivors continues in the Libyan port city of Derna, wow. Sajida Nahum listens on in horror at her home in Ottawa while her friend describes the bleak rescue efforts. They still hearing some noise, some people calling under the ground, but they couldn't reach them. First responders lack enough heavy equipment to move rubble and a functioning government to get it to them. Libya has been torn apart by civil war since former dictator Muammar Gaddafi was ousted in 2011. In 2014, Nahom fled the danger and came to Canada with her family. 
when Mediterranean Storm Daniel hit her hometown. Two dams burst, leveling entire neighborhoods. Do you see that building? It's before. Then she saw this mosque in the neighborhood where her grandmother's house used to be. Soon, friends confirmed 14 of her family members were killed. Five are still missing. It's not just death or flooding. It's memory, you know, hope, where we have a, like, beautiful gathering in Ramadan and I eat, where we're playing, where it's gone. So the deadly deluge washed away entire families. Nahum lost aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews, cousins, friends, and neighbors. Those faces, those people that you lived with them, you loved with them, you spent time with them. As global relief efforts ramp up, the nearly 8,000 people of Libyan descent living in Canada are asking the government to help. Health concerns are growing for survivors with major shortages of food and clean drinking water. Omar? Absolutely devastating and so heartbreaking. All right, Kevin, thank you. 14 months before the next U.S. election, the son of U.S. President Joe Biden has been indicted by a special counsel. Hunter Biden is facing three federal felony gun charges for allegedly lying about his drug addiction when he bought a firearm. The charges follow the breakdown of a controversial plea deal that would have seen him avoid prison time. Hunter Biden has also been under investigation for his business dealings, and Republicans have been trying to tie his father to his son's businesses. Time for a short break, but when we come back, a $100 million cocaine takedown. Plus, are you nervous yet? A 102-year-old veteran soaring at great heights for a good cause. The owner of a popular sports beverage that is the official drink of the NHL is looking to dump one of its highest profile assets. CTV's Adrian Gobriel tells us why. It's time to hydrate. A made in Toronto beverage synonymous with Canada's game. From Connor McDavid to Connor Bedard, its roster of athletes included the who's who of hockey. This is the Nike of the sports drink market, you know, or the sports drink sector. They had every top athlete. Even becoming the official drink of the NHL. This is going to be a partnership that endures for many, many, many years. Though there's multiple reports that these very deals with leagues and athletes are one of the reasons BioSteel has been put on ice. You have to have the sales outside of those sponsorships to support it, and obviously they didn't. Taken over by Canopy Growth in 2019, the cannabis company's current CEO has been open about his desire to sell BioSteel for months. We've said that we're going to review all of our options to eliminate the drag caused by BioSteel. Canopy Growth announcing that it's pulled all funding for the beverage company. The popular sports drink accounted for about 60% of its fiscal first quarter adjusted core loss. BioSteel has now commenced proceedings in Canada to protect itself from creditors and is undergoing credit protection in the USA. Probably my last board meeting where we'd structured a a plan that said, listen, we're going to buy this thing called BioSteel. Just before he was let go, former Canopy Growth CEO Bruce Linton had planned to roll out a BioSteel beverage with CBD, an active ingredient in cannabis that doesn't get you high, but is used to reduce pain and swelling. It never happened. Kind of disappointing for me is what I saw was BioSteel became almost like a try to be a competitor to Gatorade rather than be better than Gatorade and different. The company is still operational and now for sale, though if BioSteel doesn't find a buyer, the next step could be bankruptcy. Adrian Gobriel, CTV News, Toronto. Still ahead. The daring rescue mission to liberate a stranded luxury liner. A cruise ship stuck in the world's northernmost national park in Greenland has finally been pulled free. A fishing research vessel completed the operation at high tide. The more than 200 passengers on board will now be flown home from their luxury expedition early as the damage to the bottom of the ship is assessed. And Colombian Navy are assessing their haul from a massive high-stakes drug bust in the Caribbean Sea. After a high-speed chase on the water, they eventually caught up with the smugglers who had packed their boat 
with three tons of cocaine destined for Central America. Estimated street value, $100 million. And a special moment in London today where a 102-year-old Second World War veteran showed no fear. It's worth a hundred pounds to stand up here and just look at the view. Colin Bell, a former bomber pilot, descended 85 meters down the Royal London Hospital to raise money for charity. Incredible. After the break, the extra push from NASA to find extraterrestrial life. What was once considered the realm of fantasy should be taken more seriously. That's according to an independent research team commissioned by NASA. It concluded that having the space agency involved in UFO research could shift the conversation from sensationalism to science. But as CTV's Joy Malvin reports, another one of its findings was more ambiguous. On the Pentagon's website, there are military videos still considered unresolved. <laughs> After studying hundreds of unclassified, unexplained sightings, NASA's conclusion? The NASA independent study team did not find any evidence that UAP have an extraterrestrial origin. But we don't know what these UAP are. No proof aliens exist, but they might. So NASA will search the skies, appointing its first ever director of UFOs, initially not identifying him because of threats and harassment. Mark McInerney is NASA's new UFO boss. We NASA are trying to shift it from sensationalism to science. Those mysterious objects often turn out to be weather balloons, drones, or optical tricks. So the hunt for life, says NASA, needs better scientific data, advanced satellites, and tools like artificial intelligence to discover whatever the heck this is. What is going on right now? UAP are one of our planet's greatest mysteries. There has long been a fascination with creatures from another planet. NASA was even asked to weigh in on those ET-like corpses presented to Mexico's Congress as so-called evidence of alien life. The scientists here are more than skeptical. This is something that uh, we, I, I know I've only seen on Twitter. If you have something strange, make samples available to the world scientific community, and we'll see what's there. Are we alone? With billions of galaxies out there in a universe so vast, NASA is determined to find the truth out there. Joy Malvin, CTV News, Washington. Fascinating stuff, and there's still so much we don't know. That's a snapshot of this Thursday. Heather Wright will be here tomorrow. For all of us at CTV National News, thank you for watching, and good night.